can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Kareen Million, and she is the founder of Work, W-R-K, Let's Do Work.com. And before I formally introduce you, Kareen, uh, you have an amazing background. Um, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And since this is part of the Top Women Leaders series, um, we had Laura Barnard who actually introduced us, uh, Breakthrough Brands. And I was complimenting I was complimenting you on your logo and your brand. And she's like, that's Breakthrough. So we'll talk about some of the conversations you had because you had a long conversation about your vision and what you're looking for. Um, we also had um, Marsha uh, Daywood, which is she's, she talked about angel investing, the smart and healthy way, um, and with Mindshift Capital and the Angel Capital Association. Um, we had um, the secrets to standing out and growing your business with Winnie Hart of Twin Engine. Cheryl Conti talked about defeating racism in startup funding um, of Impact Seat, which kind of relate exactly relates to what we're going to talk about here. So you and Cheryl should know each other at some point. <clears throat> um, and that and many more. I expect you to make an introduction. Yeah, exactly. Well, I just did. I'm going to send her the episode. Um, and. You know, before I introduce Kareen, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And at Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the accountability, the full strategy, um, and all the execution production. So Kareen, we kind of call ourselves the magic elves that run around the background and make it look easy for the host. Um, and that's what we do. And, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And in part of the me, the reason I love the podcast is I like to make connections for people, just like I'm going to connect Cheryl and Kareen together and my past guests too. So um, check out more episodes. and. You know, Kareem, we're going to dig into the vision, the mission, but um, Kareem Million is a servant leader focusing on solutions to increase diversity and inclusion within the workforce and it really advanced professional leadership opportunities for the underrepresented. Um, and as I mentioned, you can check them out, the founder of work, it's let's do WRK.com. What they do is they're a talent sourcing firm and they specialize in connecting sports, media, entertainment companies, really any companies. And with, they have a community of qualified talent, and she's really driven to eliminate bias and barriers for those historically excluded from traditional hiring practices. And she also um, is a co-founder of a uh, 501c3, the Winning Edge Leadership Academy that empowers and elevates minority student athletes and young professionals as the young, next generation of leaders in sports and business. And she served as a graduate assistant for the legendary coach Pat Summit of the University of Tennessee before. Oh, yeah, exactly. I went to the uh, Orange Bowl, actually. Um, the the volunteers won uh, <laughs> this last oh, year. Good luck. Well, and, now you have to start coming to all the games. And I just kept saying, go Vols. It was great. People loved it. Um, and this is before working as an event supervisor for ESPN where she managed several of the companies preeminently owned and operated athletic contests and events. So we'll hear about that. And um, Kareen, I also wanted to mention too, that you were recognized by Adidas and Impact Hub um, as one of the eight social entrepreneurs of color creating impact and delivering initiatives that intersect sports equity and, and creativity. So thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm so excited. It's the best way to start my Friday that's going to end on the golf course. So I'm excited. Talk about the work you did a little bit with Breakthrough and the vision. And I'll, I'll pull up your website. We can see the beautiful brand. But talk about the behind the scenes um, vision and mission. I am a country girl. I am not a city mouse. And I was in Chicago a couple summer a couple summers ago working with Wilson Sporting Goods, one of my partners, 
with my nonprofit. And I had my dog and we were staying downtown, like right across from Trump Tower, all the cars, all the things. And after like six days, I had to get out of there. I hit Laura up, they, her and her uh, family literally hadn't even moved all their boxes in. And now I'm asking if me and my dog can crash on a bed, right? How did um, you know her? Uh, we had done some work. I was managing director of Pro Sports Assembly, um, an advocacy group for professionals working in sports. And she did some work with our members and helping them unlock their brands. So we never actually met in person. Um, but I said, hey, I got to get out of here. Can I come crash? And she said, sure, I got kids. I got dogs. We were moving. And I said, you don't even know. It's fine. And one night we're talking at dinner, just and I'm a pretty I'm a pretty big believer in closed mouths don't get fed. So I and they're pretty curious as well. Um, we had a lot of synergies in our love for basketball and they were probing me about what I wanted to do and kind of some challenges that I was facing as a an, as a founder. And I, they took one conversation into, hey, we're starting breakthrough brands. We think we could really help you. There's some resources that align here. Um, and again, I am a pretty um, risky person. I let people know um, what I'm trying to do because you never know who can help. And without them, I don't know if you're showing off this awesome website right now. Um, you can because, see it. Yeah, they did a fantastic job. And, and it really was about empowering me as a leader. So they they created the foundation of the site, but I'm able to go in there um, and, and make updates and edits and change my picture, um, and stuff like that. So it wasn't like, okay, we're doing this and then you have to lean on us for everything. Um, it's really been an empowering relationship, um, that now sees me as an advisor for them and helping connect them with as many founders and, and women as I can. Yeah, if you're watching the um, the video, if you're listening to the audio, we're looking at the Let's Do Work dot com website and the About Us page, um, where you can see some of the the companies um, that they've done work with, and um, you can see um, Corinne's bio and everything else that they do here. Um, just talk a little bit about. I mentioned you know what work does, but talk a little bit more about you know what you do as a company and some of the services you offer. Yeah. And it's funny, as you were reading the bio, it speaks to the evolution of work and how we started. And the work really, I started seven years ago with my nonprofit and doing that talent sourcing um, at the foundation level of professional development, career development, intentional relationship building for talent that turned into, can you help us connect with talent during the summer of 2020? And, and a lot of organizations making a commitment to being more serious about their hiring practices. And that's not what the nonprofit was built for. So work came about um, to formalize, instead of asking for donations, sending invoices, right, um, in the talent sourcing space. And that evolved into really coming in and providing uh, HR and employment services to our businesses to, and our clients. So you see there Eastside Golf. Um, they are um, a growing company that went from wearing sweatshirts on the golf course to being um, in a documentary directed by Hannah Storm and everybody wanting to wear their clothes on and off the golf course. One of the only the only brand to have a collaboration with Jordan um, and making me pay a lot of money to look cool on the golf course. I don't have to. I, I do. I got I, the discount is not as good as people would assume, but I, I'm going to I'm going to support those guys. I, I hired their very first intern with my nonprofit. Um, and as I grew, as they grew, we grew together. Um, and so to see that relate when you talk about relationships, um, the relationship that I have with Eastside to go again from their first intern to their first full time employees in December, you can write up. a Disney couldn't write up a better story. So with um, with Eastside um, Golf, um, what kind of work did you do with them? So it sounds like you helped them find an intern. You also helped them find some full time staff, too. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was just help us find an intern. Right now, it's we are helping them stay compliant as they grow from just the two founders and maybe a couple of um, contractors to having full time staff. Um, vendors and contractors, office space. So we're coming in and providing the full suite of HR. Um, they don't 
they are not, you know, we're in the new generation where we don't have office space. We don't need a lot of um, people. Fractional is a new wave. So we are essentially fractional HR. So we're coming in and doing payroll processing, employee employee benefits administration, um, talent management. What does um, Taylor look like in three years if she's in this company starting out as an executive assistant, right? So we are coming in, making sure they are able to focus on their goals of intersecting golf and the culture while we take care of their people. I really want to hear the evolution. You have a fascinating um, evolution of your career. And um it, it's, I don't know if we want to start at the, at what point does the Air Force come into play and, and why the Air Force? I, I was a good, bad kid in high school. I was student council president, but I also found any opportunity not to take class. So uh, ASVAB one day, hey, you can get out of class if you take the ASVAB. Sure. Took the ASVAB. A couple of weeks later, the recruiters calling, hey, you, did, you scored really well. Um, let's talk. Sure, to get me out of class again, end up saying to me, you'll be a pharmacy tech, you can take this degree, and after four years, blah, 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 convinced my mom, 17 years old, first generation American, so military, that was not a thing, So, but my dad was gung-ho about it, and it was just an opportunity. So I am 17, going through basic training, and by the time I'm 18, I'm in Germany, um, serving my country, learning a lot about um, that side of the world. As a first generation American, I had already been used to traveling. You know, it was get on a plane, somebody in Haiti will pick you up and then they'll put you back on the plane at the end of the summer and then we'll go from there. Right. So the traveling wasn't new to me. Um, but being able to go to Amsterdam for three New Year's in a row, being able to go watch a movie in Luxembourg, going to spend four days in Paris for my birthday as a 18 year old, 19 year old, and also serving my country. Um, I I sometimes forget how hard my job was. It was command and control, um, but I always found time to get involved. I won um, the volunteer airman of the year because I was coaching basketball on base. I was t coaching softball. And that's kind of where I got into sports, actually. Um, sports was not a big part of my life growing up. It was, I played golf since I was seven, but, and I played on my high school team, but it wasn't like I was on the basketball team in the track. It was, that was not the case, but it was fun. My friends did it and it got me out of things. So um, getting on base though, and starting to coach and realizing the development opportunities and the ability to influence the next generation, I was hooked. And uh, I upset the base commander's daughter by not making her the captain. And he was very impressed, impressed enough to write a recommendation to the Air Force Academy. So it was, and he just retired from generals of, of the Air Force, actually. Um, but uh, without him seeing the desire to be fair, and equal in all opportunities. I'm not at the Air Force Academy doing what I was doing. What was it like, uh, Kareen, and being a woman of color in the Air Force? I imagine it's predominantly male and predominantly white. Yes, and then in Germany. Um, and I, where our offices were was in a hangar with, air tr with um, the mechanics. So it was like the manliest of the men overnight for four days in a row. Like it was all the things, but uh, I think it really propelled my ability to be a chameleon, right? I can go in any room and find some way that you and I are connected. We have something in common. And when you focus on the ways that we have things in common, all the other things can go away. And now we have open dialogue. We can challenge each other. And that's what I've been doing for a very long time is challenging people, but they see where I'm coming from. The empathy is real because I've been in all these spaces where um, people told me the only reason I got into the Air Force Academy was because they were, I was, they were meeting a quota or whatever the case may be. But, you know, I got a big smile. Uh, people, I have, I'm pretty charming and I tend to disarm people um, in their preconceived notions. What did you find um, were people's preconceived notions? Um, well, I'm also from south of Atlanta. So and I the, the hair is usually like this. 
Um, and so most people are very surprised that I've played golf since I was seven. Like I'm, they always ask, Oh, what position did you play or what, uh, event did you run? And I'm like, no golf. That was, I was on the high school team. Um, so that's a preconception. Both, uh, English is not my first language. Um, and I was always like a translator for my parents. So I saw a lot more of the preconceived notions were put on my parents, right? Like, oh, they're not very smart or or something like that. And I'm like sitting here, my mom speaks six languages and you're telling her she's not very smart. So, um, but I think that just made me, uh, I don't want to downplay, right? Like, I don't want to say water off a duck's back because you feel it, it hurts. It takes a little chunk out of the armor once in a while, especially when you know you should be in the room, but it was something that is a part of my story and a part of my journey um, that I look back on and it makes me able to sit in a conference room with 10 people that don't look like me, never had the same experience, but bring my authentic self because it's not going to kill me, obviously. <laughs> what made your parents uh, come to the U.S.? Um, probably the same as most other people opportunity. And it's funny you ask because they definitely lived a better life in Haiti. It wasn't a situation where they're escaping some whatever at, in their immediate lives. You know, my mother, I'm probably, I have a master's degree and I'm one of the least educated people, <laughs> uh, right? So it was never, I think like the, the story people want to paint for immigrants is like, oh, it was hard and this is why they came over here. It was just an opportunity. My, you know, both my parents are educated. I'm supposed to be a doctor, lawyer, nurse, engineer, or architect right now. So um, my mom is still holding out. She still drops little links to <laughs> law school. I'm like, mom, we're way past that. So, so yeah. Now you could just help the doctor's offices, law firms and everything with their, their hiring, right? Yeah. Well, I used to think working in sports was going to impress her because she could come to games and hang out. And I think she went to one Lady Vol basketball game and maybe two because she only knows Brittany Griner. And I game in Mass Square Garden with Duke, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan State. She was not impressed with either experience. Um, she just, I even got a like VIP hospitality, go wherever you want, backs, press pass. She didn't care. Zero. Zero. <laughs> Let's move on to um, the Vols. University of Tennessee. And, and what did you learn from Pat Summit? Um, people matter. Um, by the time I got there, she had already won eight national championships, but she never left an arena if there are people still waiting on an autograph, right? Like we did camp. And at the time, this is when camps were big time. Like there was team camp, there was individual camp. There was all these camps. We were having a thousand girls and on campus and every kid got assigned basketball. And it's so funny because I can talk to someone now who are is there in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and they went to a past summer camp, they know they have that ball. They can tell me where that ball is that they got from summer camp. And she didn't have to do that. Um, I mean, we would be in another arena and people would want to autograph and she's staying until everyone is getting one. Um, the same with the letters, like everybody's getting a response. Um, it was... And every decision she made, people were at the cornerstone of that decision. And I think when we see people at a super successful level, we assume like, oh, they're they're so hard and like isolated and all these things. And she was surrounded by love because she loved, she put love out there as well. She homemade ice cream on official visits. Oh, you have a project you need, but we have this really important game go and do that project because what you're doing after basketball matters. So um, she did make me cry my first week every day. She wasn't even in the state of Tennessee, but it's okay. Why is that? Um, she, I, I was, I was, a, I was a mess. I was like coming out of undergraduate Bemidji state, Minnesota. And I'm just drove from Bemidji to Knoxville. And I don't know what's going on. And now I'm responsible for preparing for camp and moving in freshmen that I never met. And I was not doing great. <laughs> what, 
what, not- what is your favorite um, Pat Summit story? Uh, personally, whether it's game practice outside. I don't know if this is a good story, but we one year we only lost three games. <laughs> three games. That's the how many games we lost. And I remember one of those losses was in the Virgin Islands. It was like we were not supposed to lose in the Virgin Islands. And after the game, all the players were like sulking and moping around. But we had a Hanamaran ride arranged for them to go on. And they are in their minds thinking, we just lost. We're not going on this catamaran ride. This is not what we're about to do. She came downstairs into that um, dining room and said, y'all are going to have fun. You're going to go on this catamaran. You're going to do, we That's we got to move on. We have to, this is what we came to do. That's not what happened. But now we're here and we have this, we have this trip. We're not letting these people down. People, you know, are counting on us to do this. And, um, you know, I if I'm a coach, when I was a coach, if we just lost, I'm mad. Nobody. Right. Like we ain't we ain't going on the catamaran. But uh, she literally forced them to have fun. (laughs) And it was a very interesting catamaran ride. (laughs) The character where people really shows through when they lose. Yes. And again, we had only lost three games that season. <laughs> so moving on to ESPN, what were some of the things, uh, what some of your favorite stories from ESPN and what did you learn from, from ESPN? What I, as a basketball junkie, being able to go to Puerto Rico on a Coast Guard base and literally build out an entire basketball arena in a hangar while they're still running missions. Right. So um in Puerto Rico we're dealing with local vendors to put the lights put the seats put the court um and literally every element we are me and Scott Pomeroy shout out to Scott um we are we are on site handling that for four teams to come and play basketball so Minnesota and Louisville who at the time the Patinos were both coaching so Mama Patino put them on the same plane and made everybody travel together and I was like you saving us money ma'am thank you um and the Coast Guard Academy um and I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the other team but four teams playing a doubleheader in Puerto Rico on live television was pretty this was kind of when they were just starting to do the ships basketball courts on the ships and stuff like that so um being able to create unique experiences not just for the fans but for the players uh another memorable story is I one of my events was the Miak Swack challenge and it's an HBCU football game Labor Day and it's, who it's on playing? ESPN. Uh, you said what? Who is playing? Um, well, I'm going to generalize it because I, I try to create this kind of experience every year. Um, but it's a team from the MIAC and a team from the SWAC. And it's on ESPN at the time. And for a lot of these guys, this is the first time they're on ESPN. Or maybe the only time because uh, at the time, HBCUs weren't getting a lot of airtime. But Instead of giving another backpack or another journal, I said, let's give them haircuts. Let's find local barbers in Daytona Beach. Let's rent out the ballroom in the hotel. We can just set up office hours with barbers and the guys can come down as a team, hang out and get haircuts. Even though they wear helmets and all these things, you don't see that. Um, When you look good, you feel good, you play good. Um, And that was the great, those were the kind of experiences that really propelled and, and motivated me during my time at ESPN. I love it. What were some of the, I love to hear, I don't know, any other creative things that you were able to implement and do um, just for ideas. You know, there's founders, CEOs, entrepreneurs listening. I love the haircut. It's like outside the box. What else, what other creative things did you do with the events? Um, now I do, um, professional headshots. So I'm actually on a personal journey to provide 10,000 headshots. So anytime I go to a conference or I'm speaking or, um, whatever, I have a app and people can scan the app and literally take a professional headshot on the spot by themselves or with a buddy. And that could be the difference between them having a LinkedIn picture with their friend like this, um, 
or not having anything, right? A lot of, I'll talk to a lot of athletes and usually the only picture they have is of them in a uniform and they are so much more than an athlete. And so if I could talk to a group of basketball players and and now they have headshots in 20 seconds that they can now put on their LinkedIn to help them see the hey, it's not that scary over here. Come over here and get a job. Um, th- so I'm very much about an experienced person. I do. That's my jam. Like I, I, I'm everywhere and nowhere. I'm antisocial, but I like to be, um, to provide experience. So it's weird. <laughs> I love that um, headshots. And it's also a lot of times people's first impression. And I tell people, you know, treat LinkedIn like a high converting landing page because there are people, even if they know your company, they'll go directly to LinkedIn and look you up. And I had a, a person on my podcast yesterday and he showed up and I was like, how honest do I want to be with this person? I'm like, I told him, I said, your LinkedIn headshot. Um, is, does not represent you well. I mean, in general, because they're really impressive. And what they had on there was nowhere near what showed up in front of me. So it was, it was really interesting. So I, I love what you said about that. Yeah. So yeah, I do. Um, I'm a Georgia Tech women's basketball season ticket holder. And I take a lot of like leads or clients or people I want to maintain a relationship. Come to the Georgia Tech game with me. I, they're courtside seats, so that's a new experience for some people. They've never been courtside at a game. Um, and I'm the, coming down, Corinne. Done. I use Calendly, and you can find a game, any game, and it sends you all the stuff, and we have a good time. And the coaching staff at one point were very Lady Vol-esque. Like, the person who helped me get the job at Tennessee – was an associate head coach at Georgia Tech. So when the staff got the job, I immediately became a season ticket holder. Day one, I hadn't missed, I have not missed a game in four seasons because that coaching staff has shown up for me in my professional journey. Um, and I wanted to show up for them. So very big on relationships. So when you mentioned it at the beginning, I was like, yeah, this is going to be good. ESPN seems like a dream job for you, <laughs> right? So Talk about what was next and what was the decision to to move on. I think what actually helped was that ESPN wasn't a dream job. Hmm. It was a. I have all these assistant coach jobs lined up because I just became a graduate assist. I just finished being a graduate assistant for past summit and I go and go on campus, do the walkthrough, could probably go to one of two of these places and I'm not I'm feeling it. This is not what I want to do. I'm like, what people want to be in past summit or the coach K's can will never happen again in college athletics. The loyalty, like both of them would have been fired in three years if they coached now. Like it just not possible. And I there was the transition. Pat was stepping down and one of her sisters was coming in and brought in a new operations person and he came from the world of football and camps were my jam I really the logistics and all that he was like have you ever thought about bowl games I no, because I don't do football football is soccer um he made an introduction to the um now I think he's the vice president of events um and I drove to Charlotte had a conversation a couple of weeks later, I'm at ESPN working in the events department. So it, I never was like, oh, me and my family, we watch college game day every Saturday. This is my, no, I did. I did it. Even, I have never had cable since I worked at ESPN. So I never have seen the network unless someone else is providing it, which was like the whole thing in my office. So it was not a dream job. So um, when I'm there, I'm, an adjunct professor, and I create a nonprofit with my friend Maria Taylor. It was, we were really doing what we were setting out to do, which was cre- create and connect opportunities for minority student athletes. And she was blowing up, and um, we saw it as an opportunity for me to 
really dive into what we were doing full time. And it was again, it was not the dream job. So it wasn't like, oh, my gosh, am I re-? the benefits, having pet insurance, all those little cute pet things, insurance. <laughs> pet insurance, pet insurance. Um, and like the Disney passes. Yes, those were sorely missed. Um, but I still get into games somehow. Um, and if I need a Disney pass, I could still get it. So um, but I wanted to I, I've always known there is a bigger picture for me if I'm running for office. I'm not surprised. So um, seeing the opportunity to dive full time into the nonprofit was something that really drove me. So what made you decide to start work? People were taking advantage of donations when they should have been paying invoices. (laughs) Right. So the, the, the nonprofit was intentional about the career development professional development. And a lot of our partners wanted us to actually be a source of talent. We wanted to, they wanted us to go out and find the talent, bring them to them, you know, all of that. And that is a lot of work. That's a lot of work. That's another conversation. Those are other systems that are need to be in place. Um, And I am surrounded by a tribe of people who have seen me work consistently in this space of um, making sure one other people achieve their goals with their business. And two, if I can make a phone call, an email, a text that can get someone an interview, that's, I mean, that's nothing. That's, that doesn't cost me anything but my reputation if you mess up. But, um, and so I don't know if I didn't have the support of my tribe, knowing Breakthrough Brands was going to be there alongside me on the journey, if I'm doing it, but I'm so happy I did. Let's so we talked about East Side Golf. Um, let's also talk about um Moolah Kicks and what you did for them. Yeah, Moolah Kicks, the only women's basketball shoe. Um, fantastic technology. Um, I have I do I'm afraid of getting hurt, so I'm I don't have time for rehab, so I do not go on the basketball court, but I have heard nothing but amazing things about literally how the shoe is designed for women's bodies it's not like going to get a pair of steph curry's and getting them in your size right like these shoes were built for your hips how you're you know everything and how a woman plays basketball it's built to support them and she was blowing up you know she was in a microsoft surface commercial during the nba finals and she had just um got picked up to be in dick sporting goods and It was a big distribution for her and she wanted the sales associates to understand the technology. So when this when when moms and players came in to buy the Steph Curry's, the associates were saying, hey, have you seen Moolah Kicks? Let me show you these shoes. So we uh, hired we helped them find about 16 community champions across the country to essentially be those. those champions in the community, right? To help those associates understand the technology um, of the shoe and to um, be a point of connection for the community coaches, the players, like, hey, um, you should check this shoe out. And she was very particular about who she wanted to represent the brand. And that's where Work's unique experience and network stepped in. She wanted basketball players who were on campus who had um, desired to work in sales or marketing, right? And so to be able to go out in a very short amount of time and and f- find those community champions across the country, um, from LA to Texas to Indiana and New York and Georgia, um, it was it really helped them. I believe they were the number one basketball shoe for women um, in the last year. It was like a big deal. So without being able to focus on the product, you know, work coming in to help you find the talent was the big support, the big lift for them. And so we're excited for what they are going to continue to do for the game because the tagline, the uh, built by women for women, right? So, and Natalie is is going to go take this. She's not trying to be the Nike of shoes, right? She's trying to be the Speedo of swimwear, right? Like we are good at this thing right here. Come and get these women's basketball shoes. You also, you know, we talked about Eastside Golf and Mula Kicks. Um, 
and then Wilson Sporting Goods. So on, on a bigger scale, you work did work with Wilson. Yeah, and they are one of my favorite partners. They came through through CAA. So CAA is a great partner of ours, Creative Artist Agency. They also referred us to Eastside Golf, who is one of their clients. So um, Wilson wanted to be intentional about the commitments that they were making um, in the summer of 2020. And, and their um, initiative was called Allyship in Action. And so we came in to really support what that looks like from a talent um, workforce perspective. And I am I, I shouldn't be shocked anymore because the time has passed, but I am shocked. But in, we get them to pay for 20 m- micro internships for uh, minority student athletes to work in their marketing, uh, their team sales, team marketing department, which is, I don't, 20, if you're listening, you're like, oh, that's not a lot. But those are 2,200 hour, I'm sorry, 20, 20 hour projects that a student athlete who normally wouldn't have had the opportunity to gain experience um, in something other than their sport while they're in college, they don't get, right? And so the Wilson team, they really embraced and I, I don't use the word mentor a lot because not everybody's a mentor, but educated these future leaders in the different aspects of sport business and product, right? They create product. So being able to show them that if you have an engineering degree from a and North Carolina a and come on over here and help us design this zero waste football that we just launched, right? Like you can be um, whatever you think your degree is or what career you could get, you can find it in sports. And Wilson has been fantastic at creating those opportunities and just being a great partner. And I look forward to, I, I actually ran into Joe Duty, the president of Wilson at the U.S. Open. Um, I had to go see my girl, Serena. I don't know her, but you know, she's my girl. Um, and we it's like this big, massive crowd. Everybody's trying to get to see the match. And I see Joe, I say, hey, Joe, what's going on, Joe? And you could see his look. He was so shocked that I remembered him. And I see Joe coming through the crowd. He's coming to me. I'm like, the president of Wilson is actually trying to meet with me. And he literally said, I'm surprised you remembered me. I'm like, you literally created opportunities for my community. You think I'm going to forget you? Um, So I'm excited about our continued partnership and how they really want to be intentional again with how they engage talent and increase equity in their workforce. Green, who's um, a good fit? What kind of company is a good fit to work with you? A great fit is a company looking to scale. You probably have been running with a couple folks and you got a big investment or you are getting prepared for a big investment and you don't have HR internally, no one on the team has any type of people experience and you don't really wanna worry about that, that's when you call us. Um, That is the bulk of our experience. We have um, talent acquisition, talent management and a fractional CHRO on the team. And they're gonna help you create those systems early so you stay compliant later as you're growing your business. Those are the and the, and they're fun, right? We get to grow with them and really support them. And because we're uniquely um, diverse in the language of sports, the nuance of sports, we we know those challenges. We may get a call at two a.m. because um, the freelance photographer didn't show up for a shoot in Paris or whatever. So we're going to um, be nimble enough to address those. And then for the larger organizations. You, you're pretty maxed out with your team right now and everything that they're doing because you're supporting a large organization, but you have um, you want to implement a strategic initiative or you want to roll out a employee benefits program. Something that is maybe new that you're looking to implement, we can come in and support that strategy and maybe even that execution depending on the size of the team. You said, um, Kareem, before we hit record a little bit about that you check all the boxes. And so uh, I'd love for you to talk about that for a second. And and you get um, inquiries from people who are maybe head of DEI of, of companies because of that. So talk about what you meant by I check all the boxes. 
Yeah, it's kind of like uh, my tagline, I guess. It's the thing I help that helps people remember me. But I'm black. I'm a veteran. I'm a woman. First generation American. Um, I'm a dog owner. I have a Jeep. Like I'm there's so many different boxes that I'm I play golf. I love golf. I need to practice. I need to play more. That's why I'm going today. But I'm looking at the clouds. Um, but I I am whatever your cup of tea, whatever your flavor, whatever you're into, I'm pretty, I might know something about it or I'm I've done it. I got the t-shirt. I'm even taking DJ lessons right now. So if you love music, I'm going to be right there with you talking about the latest Calvin Harris record. So um, I and I love it. I don't shy away from that. Um, I embrace that because that's, again, I said earlier, like I challenge people a lot of times. I challenged Wilson. I'm like, you want interns that are student athletes. But student athletes can do interns when you have internships. So we have to create, we have to go out now and create a different type of experience for you to engage student athletes and assess them as talent, right? So, but if I don't um, speak some community, some language of a specific community in some rooms, maybe I'm not being able to get that across. So I love it. And sometimes, you know, we get those calls from DEI and we, we talk about what work is and we, we ask like, Hey, we are not just a novelty. We are a necessity, right? Like bring, can, when do you bring in the HR team into this conversation? What does that look like? So that in a year, we're not trying to chase you down um, to do business again because it was a novelty. That space it isn't in the budget anymore, but we know there are going to be people. There's a people budget. There's an HR budget and uh, repeat business. If you if you are committed to, you know, diverse vendors or diverse business, engaging diverse business, don't just do us once. Don't work with us once. Have us repeat uh, business for you. I love it. You know, Karina, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey. Thanks for sharing your, you know, sharing your story. If you've been watching the video, you can see the website. You can check it out at Let's Do Work. Let's do WRK.com to learn more. And uh, thanks, Karina, for, for sharing everything. Well, I have to thank you because I am excited for what I'm about to ask you after this conversation. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Green. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.